adolescent gynecology um, with a focus on pelvic pain and the menstrual cycle. Um, it's important to think about them as our adolescent patients as not just little adults because there are some unique conditions that can affect the adolescent population. So some of our learning objectives, we're going to go through some of the common gynecologic causes of pelvic pain in the adolescent female. Um, define the role of endometriosis um, in the adolescent population. We don't often think about that in the younger age page patient, um, but it, it's actually something that we need to start to think about when patients come in with their pelvic pain. Um, really important, generally speaking, to be able to quickly go through the differential of, an emerg of emergent gynecologic etiologies. Um, review some of the congenital anomalies that are, again, unique to the adolescent population in which a patient can present with uh, pelvic pain. Um, and also to start to think a little bit, sort of tying into some of the things that we've been hearing about this morning, about normal and abnormal menstrual bleeding patterns as well. So abdominal pain affects 15% of school age children. Of school age children. Um, chronic pelvic pain accounts for about 4% of adolescent primary care uh, visits. 10% of these patients end up getting referred to gynecology. Um, so what is pelvic pain? Let's just get some of our definitions straight. So pelvic pain is localized below the umbilicus in the lower abdomen and the suprapubic regions. Um, acute pain is more sudden in onset. Um, it's intense, it's sharp, it's severe, um, but the symptoms happen acutely. As opposed to chronic, which are symptoms that have been lasting for several months, um, by definition, about six months or so. They could be cyclic or non-cyclic in nature. Um, and chronic pelvic pain obviously becomes a problem when it actually interferes with the adolescent's uh, lifestyle. So when you think about the differential of pelvic pain in the adolescent patient, you do have to think of the full differential because they're not, it's not just GYN, although the focus of my talk will be on GYN. Um, you have to think about some of the gastrointestinal um, differentials, the urologic, the musculoskeletal, and even some psychosocial uh, um, etiologies. But the ones I'm gonna focus on today are the gynecologic ones, which are endometriosis, some ovarian cysts, ectopic pregnancies, pelvic inflammatory disease, and some of the congenital anomalies to think about. The problem with pelvic pain is that it can be very frustrating. It could be frustrating for the patient, it's frustrating for the family, it's frustrating for the doctors, because oftentimes, because there's so many different etiologies for it, um, it's sometimes hard to actually figure out what the the, what the etiology is. Um, it, it has significant health care costs when patients keep coming in, whether it's in the emergency room or it's in the primary care setting, to, to seek care to find an answer for the problem that they're having. And many times they may leave without actually having a diagnosis. Um, and the other problem that can lead to is sort of it, it skews a young woman's view of health care. She keeps going and she may not be getting answers or she's not getting a diagnosis. Um, and it frustrates her and it may have even implications on her ability to trust providers when she goes in the future for any other um, health care needs. So just a couple you know, important things to remember when a young woman comes in with acute pelvic pain, right, a sudden onset of pain. There are things that you have to think about that are life-threatening for her, because if you don't consider these diagnoses, she may actually die. Um, things like ectopic pregnancies, um, appendicitis if it you know, is, becomes septic. Um, but there's also fertility um, conditions where they become urgent for her fertility, like ovarian torsions. So if you don't think of some of these diagnoses, you may actually miss the diagnosis. Um, so when you have acute pelvic pain, always think about an ectopic pregnancy, right? All reproductive age women, anytime they're in front of you, are pregnant until you prove them otherwise. Even if they tell you they're not sexually active, you really should be doing a pregnancy test on them because you do need to rule out a, a pregnancy, and especially a pregnancy that's an ectopic because that's life-threatening, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, ovarian torsion is another concern, right? Because if an ovary gets large enough and it twists and it loses its blood supply, um, the ovary may necrose and die, and she only usually has two ovaries, and you don't want to keep surgically removing them, right, because that's going to have implications in her future fertility. Um, and one of the other things, actually, to think about is an obstructed uterine horn, which is not as common, 
but if you don't think about it, it actually gets missed, and we'll talk about some of those anomalies in a little bit. So another way of sort of uh, looking at chronic pelvic pain in terms of gynecologic etiologies is sort of classifying them into cyclic and non-cyclic um, um, components. So some of the cyclic ones are endometriosis, primary dysmenorrhea, middle schmerz, which is the you know, ovulation pain that some women sometimes get every month, um, and sometimes ruptured ovarian cysts, although they don't tend to be every single month, although it, for some people they could be. Um, cyclic, what's a little bit unique for the adolescent population with cyclic um, pelvic pain is, really, is more for those who's never, who've never had a period before because there are certain anomalies like an imperfect hymen that may actually present with cyclic abdominal pain in the setting of a patient who's never had a period before, and I'll explain why that happens. And some of the non-cyclic etiologies are pelvic inflammatory disease, some of the other congenital anomalies, um, vaginal foreign bodies, um, and sometimes patients come in who are being abused or assaulted and maybe sometimes th those who come in with chronic pelvic pain, that's their way of reaching out for help. Um, and, and it sort of comes back to making sure that the history that you take on a patient is complete, not just medically, but in the social component too, um, when you're seeing our adolescent patients. So let's think about endometriosis a little bit. So endometriosis affects about 15% of women um, of reproductive age. Um, so endometriosis is basically when the endometrial tissue is not just localized inside the uterus where it's supposed to be, but it, it's in other parts of the pelvis. And so every month when a woman has her period, all the hormonal changes not only make the endometrium shed for the menstrual bleeding, but all the tissue that's outside of the uterus can actually react too and patients come in with um, cyclic pelvic pain. Um, endometriosis is one of those conditions where the, the true diagnosis is made surgically. Um, and the interesting thing is the majority of women with surgically diagnosed endometriosis already had symptoms in adolescence, but remember, we don't <coughs> like to take everybody to the operating room if we don't need to. Um, and so we often don't know that an adolescent patient has endometriosis because we haven't operated on them. Um, Two-thirds of adolescents with chronic pelvic pain actually had laparoscopic confirmed endometriosis. Um, average of 10 years is from the symptom onset to diagnosis. Like imagine how frustrating that is for patients, right? 10 years that it takes for somebody to diagnose them with the condition that they have. Um, Endometriosis is really thought to be a progressive disease, and early diagnosis may lead to decreased infertility um, and progression of the actual um, condition. A little frustrating in terms of adolescent endometriosis because some patients present cyclically with, with the pelvic pain. Some people are um, non-cyclic, and then there's acyclic ones. So it's sort of that frustrating thing where um, Patients present in different ways, um, which makes it even more difficult to diagnose. Um, endometriosis, like I said, it's truly a surgical diagnosis. There's really a lack of non-invasive diagnostic testing. Pelvic ultrasounds, MRIs may, will not necessarily pick up endometriosis. The only time we have suggestions of endometriosis on imaging, like a pelvic ultrasound, is if there are certain um, findings on their ovaries, like endometriomas, which I'll show you a picture of. Um, and if laparoscopy is done on patients with a chronic pelvic pain, oftentimes, because they're young, we tend to see it earlier stages, stage one and stage two, instead of later staging of endometriosis. Obviously, endometriosis is not malignant, it's just the staging of it shows the extent of the disease, although it may not correlate with the symptoms. So an endometrioma sort of has this... Um, on, on the ultrasound, this is an ovary, it sort of has this homogenous texture uh, to it on imaging. And if they get large enough, we can actually see them. And we have a finding like this in a patient who sort of meets the, the clinical criteria for endometriosis. You start to think whether or not this is actually an endometrioma and this patient has endometriosis and whether or not she should be surgically operated on. And obviously when these get large enough, we tend to. Um, this is just the laparoscopic um, image of what endometriosis can present um, like, and you can see all the adhesions that um, there are in the pelvis. And you know, the other thing to think about 
with endometriosis that we may see in the adolescent population is it may not look like the classic uh, lesions that we see, the, um, the, uh, the dark lesions. Sometimes they're actually redder when we see endometriotic lesions in the adolescent patient. So again, just to have the antennas up to think about this. Like this is what sort of the endometriotic implants look like. It's these dark lesions. And usually we have to biopsy them and send them to pathology for them to confirm that that's what it is. But in the adolescent patient, it may not appear like the classic adult endometriosis. Um, so when you start to think about who could have this diagnosis, um, it's those who are presenting with the chronic pelvic plane, sometimes the cyclic, sometimes the non-cyclic. Um, those who have severe dysmenorrhea that are resistant to the normal things that usually work, like NSAIDs and um, combined oral contraceptive pills. Um, again, the extent of the pain, you have to think about it too, um, what the, when it's interfering with daily activities, those who are presenting with dyspareunia, um, patients who've had early menarche and there's a history of endometriosis in the family are also those who are at risk for endometriosis, which is why, like we've been talking about, the history is actually really important. So the typical treatment when you have a patient who comes in with, you know, you, she has the, this, this menorrhea um, and she's asking for treatment, we do the things that we normally do. We usually start with non-steroidal anti-inflammatories if the patient otherwise doesn't have a contraindication. Usually I tell them to take it a couple of days before their predicted cycle is gonna start to help with the pain. Um, sometimes we may put them on birth control pills to help sort of quiet down all the, um, all the endometriotic tissue. Um, sometimes we do only progestin only. GN GNRH um, agonists, um, not really recommended under the age of 18 because of some of the bone density things that we were talking about. So we don't routinely use uh, Lupron under the age of 18. Um, although Lupron in the older patient with endometriosis, um, there are indications for it. Like I said, laparoscopy is the gold standard for endometriosis diagnosis. Um, and you know, something that us as in the gynecology world need to start to think about when we have that young patient who is not responding to the typical medical treatments that we use, maybe we have to think about um, doing a laparoscopy to see whether or not they have endometriosis or not. Um, and again, it's important for those who are, who've seen adolescent patients who've operated on them to be the ones actually operating on them as well. Because like I said, some of the, the lesions may not be the classic appearing ones. So let's shift gear a little bit and talk about how ovarian cysts can be uh, uh, an etiology for pelvic pain. Just generally speaking, ovarian cysts can be classified into physiologic and neoplastic. The ph physiologic ones are the follicular ones or the corpus luteal cysts. Um, when you think about the neoplastic ones, they're the benign ones and the malignant ones. Mature cystic teratomas or the dermoid cyst is the uh, most common benign neoplastic um, ovarian cyst of adolescent, of young women, um, followed by serous mucinous cyst adenomas, and then you have the malignant ones. We worry about ovarian cysts in a few cases. One, if they're large, you know, cysts that become large are the ones that tend to torse. Normal size ovaries with small cysts don't tend to torse. Important thing to remember, because we do get a lot of referrals, you know, maybe a primary care order a pelvic ultrasound on a young patient with pelvic pain who has a one centimeter cyst. That ovary is not torsing, or it's very unlikely to be the one that is the one that you have to worry about, about torsion. The other thing that we worry about, so just not in terms, just it's not just the size, but it's also how the cyst appears on imaging. If there are features that may suggest the malignancy, and those are the patients that we have to think about um, uh, operating on them. In the in this adolescent population, oftentimes these are our patients that we meet. You know, these patients probably haven't seen a gynecologist yet, and they present to the emergency room with acute pelvic pain and they may be presenting with an ovarian torsion. So um, something to think about. So I'm just gonna dwell on mature cystic teratoma for a little bit. Um, it's the most common ovarian neoplastic lesion in the adolescent. Um, accounts for about 55% of ovarian tumors in this population. That's actually one of the answers to a question um, on the quiz. 
um, it's a benign type of germ cell tumor. It's slow growing, which is important to know. It's about two millimeters per year in terms of how much it grows in size. They can be bilateral in 10 to 20% of cases, which is important to think about. Um, and they, tip they have typical characteristic appearance on ultrasound. Um, and this is the dermoid cyst. And I'm gonna show you what they actually look like in real life in a little bit. This is a 3D ultrasound of what a dermoid um, can look like. So dermoid cysts, again, when they get large enough, and usually the number we use in terms of size is above five centimeters. Those are the ones that are, they tend to be the ones that torse. Um, so they're increased risk for torsion if they get to a certain size. Um, they could be bilateral, it's important to know. And we operate on them when a patient becomes symptomatic, if they start to become large, or they actually are growing faster than what a, a benign dermoid should grow. Because then you start to think about whether or not it's an immature teratoma or another ne um, malignant neoplasm. Um, and then the surgical approach is laparoscopic or laparotomy, depending on what we think is appropriate for the patient. You know, we are really just striving for the laparoscopic surgery um, to, um, to help surgically treat uh, the cysts that we deal with, but not all patients are obviously are candidates for that. So after having an ovarian cystectomy in an adolescent patient, if it was done laparoscopically, the recurrence rate is 15%. Um, in an adult who had a dermoid cyst removed laparoscopically, the recurrence is 4%. Um, and if, a pa if an adolescent had a laparotomy for a dermoid cyst removal, the recurrence is about 4%. And I don't know about zero, but it's much lower in the adults. Typically, there's no set rule of how we follow a patient once we remove an, a dermoid cyst but we tend to repeat ultrasounds every year just to see whether or not she, is, she has another one on the other side or, the same, or one on the one that was already operated on um, and to just follow it um, over time. So this is an ovary that's enlarged. This is a laparoscopic picture. This is a specimen of what a dermoid actually looks like. It's gross. It has hair, it can have teeth, it can have fat, it can have lots of gross things in it. Um, that's another one. That's another one. Another one. Um, so just generally speaking about ovarian torsions, there are 3% of gynecologic emergencies. 15% of torsions that occur actually occur in the adolescent young adults. Um, and ovarian torsions are likely related to ovarian 660 to 80%. The right side tends to be more than the left. And you know, sometimes we don't know. Sometimes somebody comes in with pelvic pain, they have a large ovarian mass that appears, has features that suggest that it's torsed. It could be the left, it could be the right. Sometimes the, the mass is so big that we don't even know which side it's coming off of. We don't know until we actually operate on them. Um, oftentimes the symptoms of a torsion are the acute symptoms that a patient comes in with. Sudden onset of pelvic pain or abdominal pain. Usually something triggered it, you know, maybe they had um, had recently been sexually active, um, something that triggered that ovary, or for some reason we've seen a lot of like people who are in gymnastics, who are flipping, flopping, that ovary's twisting, horseback riders, we get them all the time, and unfortunately those are the patients who wanna go back to those activities that we don't want them to do, but. And then they can come in with signs of an acute abdomen, right, the pain, the nausea, the vomiting. Um, fever's not that much, but it could be. Um, and other than the physical exam and the history, the pelvic ultrasound is probably the next best test to order in terms of imaging. Um, to identify an ovarian torsion can be challenging. Um, and operating on them, what we want to do is we want to be able to operate on them if we need to operate on them and save the ovary, right? We don't want to pluck out or completely remove the ovaries of our young patients. Right, because if we remove one, they only have one left. If they had two to start with, like most people do, um, and then you know, if God forbid something happens to the other ovary, you remove both ovaries, and you know they're not going to be able to. Um, it's going to be obviously affect their fertility. What we try to do is we actually, even if we have a torsion in any for a young patient, we try to remove the cyst only and leave the rest of the ovary alone, and then just follow it up. Um, 
symptoms and not by ultrasound. Um, again, obviously as part of our surgical management, we detorse and the approach can either be laparoscopic or a laparotomy. Um, so the, the, really the push is to just remove the cyst in, a, in the event of a torsion, um, especially in our young patients where we don't want to remove the whole adnexa. Recurrent torsion risk is two to 5%. Um, there are even some studies, and again, we don't really know the, really how beneficial it is, but sometimes for patients who are having recurrent ovarian torsions to see if we can pexy the ovary to the sidewall, um, but that may not work. Um, the pexy may fail, um, and she may still be at risk for torsion. So we don't really have great long-term studies for that. So that's a torsed ovary. It's all blue. Um, hemorrhagic cysts can also cause acute pelvic pain. Um, we don't necessarily have to operate on hemorrhagic cysts, or even if they're non-hemorrhagic and they're just a ruptured ovarian cyst. They tend to cause acute pain, and then they resolve. Um, we really only have to operate on hemorrhagic cysts if we think the patient is continuing to bleed internally. Um, or their pain is not getting better over time, or their hemoglobin is dropping. Um, and again, it's, it's sort of hard because they're presenting with similar type of symptoms, right? A sudden abdominal pain, which can be associated with nausea and vomiting. Um, and again, like I said, we don't have to operate on all of them, only if there's things that make us think that she's continuing to bleed, or her symptoms are not getting better in the time frame, about 48 hours or so. We're going to shift gears to ectopic pregnancies. Um, one in 100 pregnancies in this country are ectopic pregnancies. Greater than 95% of them are in the fallopian tube. Um, really important to think about ectopic pregnancies, right? The most common, it's the most common cause of maternal mortality in the first trimester. Um, the case fatality rates have been decreasing since the 1970s. And it's, I think it's because we're diagnosing them better. We have better blood tests that we can pick up the hormone pregnancy levels and better imaging um, and so that we can actually diagnose it and, and treat appropriately. Patients who have had a history of pelvic inflammatory disease, um, history of infertility, but again, in the young patient, that's usually not the case or the history. Um, those who have increased risk of assisted reproductive um, t uh, procedures like IVF, those who've had previous tubal surgery, smokers are all at risk for ectopic pregnancies. So this is just like a diagram, right? This is, this is the uterus, these are the fallopian tubes. Um, so 95% of ectopic pregnancies um, are in the fallopian tubes. And the fallopian tubes are very thin, they're probably half the thickness of my pinky finger. And so if you have a pregnancy that's growing, 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 and it ruptures the tube, the patient's gonna internally bleed, um, which is life-threatening. Um, but this diagram also shows that Yes, 95% of them occur in the tubes, most common in the ambulatory, ambulatory area. Um, but you can have ectopics on the ovary, you can have them grow on a C-section scar, they can be cervical ectopics, they can be right where the tube meets the uterus, so they can all be in interesting places. And sometimes the medical management or, there's, or the surgical management differs according to where they are. But you know, the point of this is to think about the diagnosis, to think about all your reproductive age women in front of you are pregnant until you prove them otherwise and your differential is really important. So usually the classic triad of symptoms that a patient presents with is secondary amenorrhea, um, pelvic or abdominal pain, and vaginal spotting. Usually they don't come in with heavy vaginal bleeding um, in, the second, in the setting of secondary amenorrhea. And then if there is significant internal bleeding, they're gonna present with dizziness, lightheadedness, pleuritic chest pain. Um, on your pelvic exam, 20% of the time you may feel an anexal mass. The diagnosis is based on what the patient presents with, a pregnancy test, if, it's, if her pregnancy test is positive. We usually do a blood count and type and screen. You wanna know what her starting hemoglobin is. You do want to have blood available for the patient if, um, if necessary to transfuse. Um, oftentimes, if, we, if the patient's stable enough to get an ultrasound, we'd like to do an ultrasound so if we can see whether or not there's a pregnancy inside the uterus or if there is suggestions of a ruptured ectopic. Um, the management of an ectopic pregnancy depends on the patient, it depends on 
ultrasonography, I can't even say the word right now, um, the ultrasound findings um, and um, how the patient presents and what medical conditions that she has, but the treatment is either medical or surgical. Um, obviously, the patient who is not stable needs surgical management. The patient who is stable, who otherwise meets certain criteria, are actually candidates for medical treatment with methotrexate. And again, this is where all our gynecologists get involved. This is where we get, we get consulted in the emergency room to help figure out what is the best um, management for that patient. So this is what an ectopic pregnancy looks like. Again, this is laparoscopic. Um, <coughs> That's the, that's the uterus over there. This is all blood from the, this is the ectopic pregnancy, this is the fallopian tube, and this is where the pregnancy um, implanted, and now it's starting to bleed. And so when we go in, oftentimes, if it's already ruptured, we actually have to remove a part of that tube. So it's a partial salpingectomy. Our ideal treatment is laparoscopic, again, if we're able to get um, adequate access to the visualization. So next condition, pelvic inflammatory disease. Important to think about it in our adolescent patients. Um, pelvic inflammatory disease is infection of the upper genital tract, which is caused by polymicrobes, um, sexually transmitted pathogens, and bacteria from the vaginal flora. Chronic pelvic pain is actually a well-known sequela of PID. In the US, 20% of PID is diagnosed in teenagers, the highest rates in ages 15 to 19. Um, obviously, this is sort of like what we've talked about in terms of um, if they haven't used safe sex practices or they're not aware or they have multiple, part, um, multiple partners, they put themselves at risk for chlamydia, gonorrhea, um, and of getting pelvic inflammatory disease. Um, it's important to make the, the diagnosis correctly and to treat appropriately, but also to not overdiagnose pelvic inflammatory disease, right? Because oftentimes our chronic pelvic pain patients get misdiagnosed with pelvic inflammatory disease, and then they have this, you know, the patient has this diagnosis that they're always with, even though the diagnosis may not have been correct. Sometimes genital warts can present with pelvic pain. Um, it's more directed in the vulva vaginal area, um, but these are what genital warts can look like, um, related to HPV 6 and 11. It's, it's an incurable infection, but it's treatable, and it is a sexually transmitted infection. And that's why our HPV vaccine is important, too, because it covers the two most common causes of genital warts. Um, this was actually um, a patient that came in with, six-year-old patient who came in with vaginal discomfort, like she was telling her mom something was bothering her. She was actually a, a rape uh, victim, and we, she had genital, she had warts that we here that obstructed her little vaginal introitus and actually her urethromiatus. We took her to the OR, we excised as much of it as we could and sent a pathology just to confirm that that's what it was and it was. Um, and uh, on top of that, they identified HPV high risk 18 on her. Um, so again, the, the examination is important too, depending on what it patient is presenting with. Um, I'm showing this diagram only because I'm going to show some pictures that will, it's important to know what normal is supposed to look like before you can figure out what abnormal is. Um, but just take a look at the, of the introitus right now, and this is the hymen area, and this is what the normal should look like. And so you can have different lesions of the hymen, um, different abnormalities that a patient can present with, and these are sometimes the patients that present with um, cyclic pelvic pain with no period. And that's this one, that's the imperfect hymen, where the hymen completely obstructs the vaginal introitus, right? This is an annular hymen, this is a cribriform, where the hymen is just like little, little small perforations. You can have a septated hymen, um, and then this is what the introitus and hymen looks like, right, of a woman who's given birth before. So it's this one, the imperfect hymen, that tends to present with the second, the amenorrhea, actually, it's primary amenorrhea with cyclic pelvic pain, right? The menstrual blood is forming, but it's not coming out because it's blocked. The septate hymen, those patients usually have menstrual bleeding, right? There is the, enough of an opening. Those patients are usually the ones who have the um, problems 
sometimes inserting tampons, but more often removing tampons because the tampon actually gets stuck on that, on that band of the hymen. Um, so this is, uh, just look at this normal. Um, and then we have a patient where this was a septated hymen. She had a hymen, a, a span of tissue that went vertically. And what we did was we took her to the OR and we excised that. Um, another one where we take, we, you identified, you have to examine her, sort of go with what her history is, examine her, and then oftentimes the treatment for it is, you can't do this in the office in our young patients, so we often take into the operating room and um, excise the, the band of tissue that's not supposed to be there. So we had a patient like this. We had a 14-year-old who came in with cyclic abdominal pain and pelvic pain, and she never had a period. She shows normal, otherwise, um, uh, pubertal development, normal breast, normal hair development. She had been presenting multiple times, actually, to her, the nurse's office, uh, to the point where she wasn't fully evaluated, but they actually thought she was being abused at home because she kept coming in with this pelvic pain, pelvic pain, pelvic pain. They had typhus involved. Um, and she was having such severe pain one time, she ended up in the emergency room, um, and she had an ultrasound that showed that her uterus was filled with blood, and her whole vagina was filled with blood because she had an imperfect hymen, right? So you can see, you see that bluish bulge at the introitus, right? So this is the patient that we took to the operating room, um, and we opened the hymen and sutured it open so that the, and we had lots of blood come out of there. It was all, you know, accumulated, but it was an act of bleeding, but um, we, we allowed the blood to come out, um, and then we just followed her over time um, after we surgically corrected the problem. So again, you know, months went by before this patient was diagnosed with the, with, with the correct diagnosis. Um, and so, the exam, again, you know, we try to avoid doing the exams, but when it's indicated, it's really important to do the exam because otherwise you miss the diagnosis. And so this was her post-repair, right? Okay, so some congenital anomalies to uh, think about um, in our adolescent patients as well. Um, so the incidence is about 3%, but many may be un, uh, undiagnosed, so we don't know that it was happening. The other thing to remember when you have a congenital anomaly of the reproductive system, that oftentimes 20 to 30% of the time there's associated renal anomalies as well um, when we have our patients with our mal malarian defects. So um, as you're evaluating them for a malarian anomaly, it's also important to make sure that you do um, evaluation for renal anomalies as well. So a couple ways, I guess sort of an easy way to think about this is for the fallopian tube, the uterus, the cervix, and the upper two-thirds of the vagina to develop, um, you have the malarian ducts, which are the paramesonephric ducts, they first need to form, they need to fuse, and they fuse caudally to cranially, and then the, then the septum in between needs to be resorbed, and it's resorbed caudally to cranially as well. So a defect of either formation of the um, malarian structures, a fusion, or a resorption can lead to different types of malarian anomalies. So if you have um, a malarian agenesis or hypoplasia, you may end with MRKH syndrome, where the uterus doesn't form, right, because the malarian structure didn't form. You can have, if one side forms but the other doesn't form, then you can have a unicorn uterus, where you have a uterus that has one horn only on one side. And I'll show you some pictures of that. If you have a fusion problem, and the lateral fusion is actually the more, most common of the malarian duct anomalies, you can have a uterine didelphus, which means that you have a double uterus, a double cervix, and a double vagina with a septum in between. 
Um, or if you have a septal resorption problem, you have a uterus that's on the outside normal, but because the septum inside didn't fully resorb, then you have a septum on the inside of the uterus. So this is what the different uh, anomalies look like. So that's, so that's a normal uterus with a one cavity on the inside and a normal fundal contour. Um, you can have uterine hypoplasia or agenesis where you have a very rudimentary uterus form. You can have a unicorn uterus where only one side of the uterus form, so this is not a normal sized uterus, right? It's one horn. You can have a uterine didelphus like this where you have two separate horns, two cervixes, a vagina with a septum. The septum's not here yet, or it's not in this picture. You can have a bicornate uterus, which is also a fusion problem where the fusion occurred, but it didn't occur all the way up to the fundus. So the bottom part of the endometrium, this part is one cavity, but then you have two horns up top. And it's usually a heart shape at the fundus here. That's what a sort of classic for a bicornate uterus. And then you have a septated uterus where the fusion occurred, but then the resorption of the septum in between didn't happen. And an arcute is almost a normal variant. And then this is not a malarian, it's a DES. So remember when I said one of the acute causes of, of pelvic pain could be if you have a unicorn uterus, um, especially if you have a non-communicating horn. So in a unicorn uterus where you only have one side of the malarian uh, duct's form, um, you, can have, uh, you can have a communicating horn and a non-communicating horn. So if you have a non-communicating horn, for this unicorn uterus, right? That's actually filling up with blood with her menstrual cycles, but it's not shedding, so it's going to distend, distend, and cause pain. This is rare. This is not stuff that we commonly see. Um, but it's important to think about um, in your differential. Another way that they come in with some pelvic discomfort, and again, this is more of an external discomfort, is our patients who come in with labial hypertrophy. So at puberty, the labium um, enlarge and grow to adult size. There's marked variation in what's normal in terms of size, shape, appearance, and symmetry. Um, but sometimes, actually, for some reason, and we don't really know why, sometimes the labia just grow too much. Um, and they can be functionally or physiologically distressing. And patients feel funny. Like, they feel like it get, their labia gets caught in their underwear. They can't put um, tampons in comfortably, or it in interferes with their ability to have sex. Um, and it distresses them. Um, so part of the evaluation when somebody comes in and says something's wrong down there is to actually evaluate them and look. Oftentimes it's normal. Oftentimes what they have is normal and they just need to be you know, reassured that people's anatomy look different. Um, and what she may be having, if once you evaluate her, is likely normal. You also have to screen these patients for body dysmorphic disorder too, because you know they may be the patient who, if they think that's abnormal, then they think their body, you know, their body weight is not normal, and so part of that also goes into the screening for this. But then there are patients who the labia is not normal, right? Like, and it actually interferes with their ability to, for hygiene purposes, even too. Like you can see how this labia is just so long. Um, I think when we had measured this one, this was almost about 10 centimeters long on one side um, and a little bit long on the other side. And so what we did was we took her to excise that excessive labial tissue. And this, usually we do it in a patient who's like reached 17, 18 years old um, before we do this. And obviously, you know, we don't want to take people to the operating room who don't belong in the operating room because any type of surgical procedure we do does have risks to it. You can have scarring that can occur after a labioplasty. You can have dyspareunia. You can have a hematoma form at the site, um, edema. The surgical site can get infected. So if, you, if there really is an anomaly that could be fixed in the appropriate page, each patient, that is something to think about. And again, you know, this is where your gynecologic <laughs> colleagues are very important because we can help figure out what's normal and abnormal. We had this patient who came in with 
something growing on her labia and she was afraid to show her mom. She was about 17 years old and she was just afraid to tell anybody about it. And then one time somehow her mom saw and she's like, what is that? And so they brought her to us and um, she actually ended up having this large labial cyst, which was benign. We removed the whole cyst um, and then we had to do a trimming of that labia because it had just all that redundant tissue. Um, again, if you don't examine her, you'll never know what's wrong with her. So for the evaluation of pelvic pain, the history is very important, including a gynecologic and a sexual history. Um, the physical exam is also important, but you tailor it to whether or not you think it's appropriate for the patient um, that you're evaluating. Um, you have to tailor the exam to the age and the maturity of the patient. I find that it's obviously very important to talk to the patient through the exam. You know, if a patient knows and can anticipate what you're going to do, they're much more willing to allow you to examine them. But if they have no idea what you're going to do, it scares them and they won't let you examine them. Um, we really want to avoid doing bimanuals or speculum exams in the virginal or sexually immature patient um, unless you really think that that's going to give you a piece of information that's going to help your med medical management of the pa or surgical management of the patient. Um, and in our institution, we actually, for our patients who we want to avoid doing transvaginal ultrasounds, who we think a pelvic ultrasound is necessary, we actually offer translabial pelvic ultrasounds where the probe is not inserted into the vagina, it's just put externally to get a little bit closer to the nexa, but not necessarily with, a, with an internal probe. So some indications for a pelvic exam in the adolescent patient, somebody who comes in with persistent abnormal vaginal discharge, um, dysuria or other urinary symptoms in a sexually active um, adolescent girl. Um, like we said, dysmenorrhea that just doesn't respond to the normal treatment that we give. Um, those with amenorrhea, um, abnormal vaginal bleeding, lower abdominal pain, um, somebody who we're thinking about doing a, um, a long-acting reversible method like an IUD. Um, we do recommend a pap smear, but pap smears, the current guidelines are starting at the age of 21, not prior. Um, patients who are suspected or reported rape or sexual abuse, and usually we do have um, special counselors and nurses available for that initial testing for that, um, and those who are pregnant. Just some things to think about with the examination techniques. Um, usually patients do prefer to be examined by somebody who they're familiar with, which is also one of the reasons why it's nice that a patient establishes care with a gynecologist earlier on um, in their adolescence, just to have somebody to go to if they need it. Um, and to be able to establish that rapport and trust with the patient so that they'll let you examine her. Um, patients should be reassured, steps of the examination should be explained, and always have a chaperone with you um, in the room as well. You might want to think about certain positions. Oftentimes the frog position is an, a good way to do an exam on a young patient where they don't have to place their heels in the footrests. They can actually just put their heels together and just relax their knees open. So um, if you can just do a visual inspection, sometimes if you have them on their knees um, and in that position, you might be able to examine them as well. Um, just, you know, things to think about, especially when you're in, in an emergent setting and you're trying to do an exam if you think it's necessary. So the last part of what we're going to talk about um, in this lecture is using the menstrual cycle as a vital sign in the adolescent patient. Um, it's really important to understand what's normal for the adolescent patient in terms of menstrual patterns and, and what's abnormal. Um, and to be able to have the skills to evaluate the patient. Um, I really think, and this is actually one of our ACOG, um, uh, it's either a bulletin or it's one of the committee opinions, that the menstrual cycle should be an additional vital sign. I don't even think in medical school we teach this enough, where, you know, blood pressure pulse, you need to ask the a, a young reproductive age woman the first day of her last menstrual period. It really can be a reflection of their overall health, and it will also help you in your differential diagnosis to make sure that you always think about pregnancy as a differential if needed. Um, Polycystic ovarian syndrome, we've talked about a little bit about it um, in other lectures today, but we'll discuss it in the setting of how you can use the menstrual cycle to help you figure out whether or not a patient is at risk for polycystic ovarian syndrome, which can also put them at risk for other health conditions later on in their life, like diabetes, cholesterol, hypertension. Um, 
we as clinicians should be educating our patients about what's normal and what's abnormal. Um, so to help assure patients, sometimes patients think that you know, their cycles are not normal, but they're not really keeping track of them properly. And then when you teach them how you're supposed to keep track of your cycles, and when you have them follow up, then, then you can get a better gauge of whether or not what they're telling you is normal or not for them. Um, and again, adolescents may not be comfortable discussing these things, and they may worry about what's normal for them. And so just to have this open dialogue where they feel comfortable about telling you as a provider information about themselves is uh, very useful. So average age of menarche is about 12, 12.4. Um, in the first year after a girl gets her period, the cycles are about 32 days in length. Um, generally, they will become somewhere between 21 um, to uh, 45 days. The menstrual flow should be seven days or less. Um, and usually what's normal is about using less than three to six pads or tampons per day um, within their flow. Um, you know, a good way to sort of figure out whether or not their flow is normal is to ask them, how often do you change your pad? How often do you change your tampon? Usually changing them every one to two hours over a course of a couple of days, that's significant. Um, that usually doesn't fl um, fall into the normal category. Um, the higher BMI part, we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little about when we get into polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, so menarche usually occurs within two to three years after thelarche, which is with the breast uh, budding. Um, and it doesn't happen usually before Tanner stage four breast development occurs. Um, by age 15, 98% of females will have menarche. So the evaluation for primary and amenorrhea should be considered for any adolescent who has not reached menarche by age 15 or has not done so within about three years of breast development. And if the girl doesn't have any breast development by the age of 13, that also should be evaluated. Um, cycles are often irregular in the adolescent age range, particularly um, the interval from her first menstrual cycle to her next second menstrual cycle. Um, and like we had touched upon before, immaturity of the HPO axis is what leads to the anovulation. Um, Again, however, in the adolescent population, about 90% of cycles will get into the proper, eight, um, proper range within about a couple of years, about two to three years of starting her periods. Um, so by the third year after menarche, 60 to 80% of menstrual cycles are 21 to 34 days long, which is what typical adult cycles should be. If you have a girl who has cycles that are 90 days apart, even if it happens once, that probably should be evaluated. Um, and that's what the current recommendation is. So abnormal uterine bleeding is characterized by unpredictable timing and variable amount of flow. Um, like we had said before, I mean, in the books they write the average blood loss is about 30 cc's and the chronic loss more than 80 is considered abnormal, but it's really hard for a patient to tell you how many cc's that she bleeds, which is why the question to sort of ask is, you know, how many pads or how many tampons do you change? Um, in a given day, and anything more than one to two hours consistently is excessive, and especially if the flow lasts for more than seven days. Keep saying this like a million times, but um, you always have to think, anybody comes in with abnormal uterine bleeding, who's a female? Always think about pregnancy. Think about immaturity of the HPO axis. Think about some of the hyperandrogenic causes of anovulation. PCO, congenital adren adrenal hyperplasia, androgen-producing tumors. Um, p when, when young girls come in with excessive bleeding with their cycles, you really have to think about uh, coagulopathy and bleeding disorders, and that's part of our evaluation. Um, think about hypothalamic disorders. We had mentioned things like eating disorders, um, being obese, being too underweight, or having significant variations in your weight can also lead to abnormal cycles. Um, and sometimes sexually transmitted infections, cervicitis may present with um, abnormal uterine bleeding. Hyperprolactinemia, thyroid disease, primary pituitary disease, primary ovarian insufficiency, but that's usually more with amenorrhea. 
um, iatrogenic causes of abnormal uterine bleeding, things that may affect her platelets, her CBC, radiation chemotherapy, um, medications that she may be on, including birth control pills or Depo-Provera that she may have forgotten to tell you that she's on, which is why the history is so important. You have to think about malignancies, especially estrogen-producing ovarian tumors, androgen-producing tumors, um, and again, some of those uterine things that we talked about earlier. So PCOS in the adolescent patient has lifelong implications for her. It can lead to infertility, um, it's associated with metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, and other health implications. Um, cardiovascular disease, those who are chronic anovulate, um, chronically anovulatory are at risk for endometrial carcinoma over time or endometrial hyperplasia. So it's important to identify this, to think about it, and to properly treat. And again, prevention is sort of the key, and the earlier we can treat, the, or the pr earlier we can pick up on a diagnosis, the more we, should, we could be able to help a patient. So you want to start to think about polycystic ovarian syndrome in an adolescent who presents with menstrual irregularities, signs of hyperandrogenism, right? Um, excessive hair, excessive acne, um, and the individual who is obese. Um, Like we've said a million times, um, we want to focus on the history and the exam because there will be clues in the history and on physical exam findings that can help suggest the diagnosis of polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, like we said, the hair, the acne, um, acanthosis in the back of the neck, um, that may be suggestive. Um, some of the things to think about when you're evol evaluating a girl with polycystic ovarian or somebody who you're thinking about anovulatory cycles that could be polycystic, um, pregnancy tests, checking their TSH, because we know um, thyroid abnormalities can cause cycle irreg irregularities. Think about doing testosterone levels, total or free, depending on the lab. Um, our PCOS patients tend to have elevated testosterone levels. Um, and if you do have elevated testosterone levels, you also want to think about other conditions that can lead to excessive androgen, right? Um, 17-OHP and DHEAS to uh, rule out non-classical congenital adrenal hyperplasia, um, secondary to 21 hydroxylase deficiency, um, to think about adrenal tumors that may be secreting the DHEA, to do prolactin testing, which has to be fasting and it has to be when the patient is calm. Um, the cortisol testing, the 24-hour urine that we talked about for Cushing's, um, and then to do some of the markers for metabolic syndrome, hemoglobin A1C, a lipid panel, even thinking about, you know, testing family members or suggesting that family members, because we tend to see metabolic syndrome things happen in families, to suggest that they get tested as well. Um, in terms of treating the adolescent patient who you suspect has polycystic ovarian, and it's really a clinical diagnosis, right? It's that patient who fits the picture of irregular cycles with signs of hyperandrogenism. Um, and the way we think about treating it is try to figure out what we're trying to treat, right? So if it's the abnormal uterine bleeding that's the problem, um, whether it's an irregularity or an excessive bleeding that the uh, PCOS is leading to birth control pills, right? Combined oral contraceptives work well. Um, a progesterone IUD, it actually is very protective for the endometrium. And so that might be an option in a patient with PCOS. Maybe somebody who is unable to take estrogen or cannot take a pill every day, but who has to be willing to be able to tolerate the insertion of an intrauterine device. Um, if it's primarily the signs of the hyperandrogenism that you're trying to treat, um, combined birth control pills do work well. Um, since we know that PCOS is related with obesity and insulin resistance, there, is, there are studies that are showing about the use of metformin, um, which is an insulin sensitizer, um, to help with PCOS. And really there's a debate about that even in the adolescent population, like what sh should we be using metformin or should we be using birth combined oral contraceptives or some of the progestin IUDs that we talked about, and really is patient dependent. If you really need the contraceptive benefit in addition to the cycle control and the, um, the irregularity and flow, birth control pills are probably the best. If she's not sexually active, but she has the metabolic syndrome type picture, then maybe the metformin is the better answer. It's individualized. We don't have a definite right answer right now. <laughs> 
um, we sort of talked about <coughs> this and uh, the von will so in the in the patients with the heavy bleeding the von Willebrand panel for the bleeding disorders is important to do um, so generally speaking there's many etiologies for pelvic pain and abnormal uterine bleeding in the adolescent um, some etiologies are non gynecologic the focus of our talk was the gynecologic ones you know, fear and anxiety about pelvic exams are known <coughs> barriers to the evaluation of pelvic pain in our young patients, even in our older patients, right? People don't want a pelvic exam if they don't need to, and they fear going to a doctor because of that. Um, however, hopefully they do seek care, prompt diagnosis, and appropriate management are essential to preserve functioning and reproductive health. Um, and a lot of the surgical management that we do really focuses on fertility preserving uh, procedures. This is one of my favorite slides. <coughs> what is this one? So this is actually, this is a selfie that a patient took because she didn't want anybody looking at her. This is her imperfect hymen. She, again, was having cyclic uh, pelvic pain. She never had a period. Um, and one time the pain got really bad. She took a selfie. This is the picture. Um, and then this actually, after she took this picture, it actually opened up itself while she was on vacation in Israel. Um, and so she ended up going to the emergency room. Like the whole family was panicking, right? Because there's all this like dark blood coming out of her. Um, but she had an imperfect hymen. Um, and again, was never diagnosed, even though she had months and months and months and months of symptoms. 